So thanks a lot for uh, deciding to spend your um, Tuesday uh, afternoon um, or evening for Switzerland standards uh, uh, with uh, with me today. Um, I am um, one of the one of the people, one of the students in in the video was saying, "I look forward to hearing the solutions." I don't want to pretend that I'm going to sit here and tell you how everything gets solved. Uh, so at least to my mind, my mind uh, this is meant more as a, as a conversation on some of these issues that I am confident you are um, extremely uh, concerned about. As, uh, as, uh, as was mentioned, I will try to give you just a broad overview of what my work has been about. Uh, it is impossible for me to pack uh, two years of, uh, of uh, pandemic life uh, into a 20-minute presentation, so I'll just give you some uh, um, thoughts here and there, uh, which also should give uh, provide uh, ample uh, scope to then go into greater details in the question uh, and answer. As I was mentioning, the, um, there's a book. <laughs> Uh, behind uh, behind all this, all this. Um, and I just wanted to uh, to mention this is a book that I mean it was published by Harvard University Press, but it was published just before the summer, so it's a recent book. I am still uh, on tour, if you can say that for for book authors and not only for for singers. Uh, it is a a book that is um, is written for a broad audience. Yeah or at least uh, I've tried to write it with broad audiences in mind. It is not an economics textbook. You don't have to have a PhD in economic growth. Uh, nobody should, maybe. <laughs> but um, you don't need, you can have any background you want. You just need to have an interest in, in these uh, topics and the book should be, uh, uh, let's say, <laughs> available uh, or uh, intelligible. Uh, to you and the, the way to do that while uh, preserving a degree of rigor is that the book is sort of divided in two parts. So the actual um, body of the book is around 200 pages, easy to read, examples and so on, and everything that is more technical reflections, papers, references and so on for the keenest or bravest among you is all packed in the end notes, which are roughly half of the book, or a third of a third of give you a, give you a sense. So when uh, giving these uh, these presentations around, I've uh, I've figured that the best way to just give you a sense of um, why I decided to write on these topics and what the book is sort of about, in uh, really in a nutshell, is to give you a bit an idea of the genesis of this book, I've already mentioned to you that it is uh, very much a pandemic uh, product. Um, people talk of pandemic babies as babies that came out of the lockdown. Uh, this is my pandemic brain child. Uh, you might recall at the beginning of the, in the early phase of the, of the pandemic, there was a, a new virus um, and we didn't have treatment, we didn't have vaccines, so a government in many countries decided in favor of lockdown measures, stamp home order, call them uh, whatever you want. So we were locked at home, locked at home, and everything was sort of going bad. So wherever you looked, things were going bad in the sense that obviously the public health situation was very bad. Uh, hospitals were uh, full, uh, people were dying in flocks. On top of that, uh, for those of us uh, that spend their time looking at economic indicators. Also, economic indicators were plummeting. Uh, confidence in the future was plummeting. Consumption was plummeting. GDP was plummeting. And for those that were looking for a silver lining, there was one silver lining. It was that uh, what was picked up in the news as nature is healing. Uh, and this came uh, out in the form of you know, quality of the air indicators started to improve. Um, CO2 emissions started to drop. Um, uh, quality of started to improve at some point. Even dolphins were spotted uh, um, in Venice's canals, or at least so said the social media. Later on, uh, these pictures proved to be fabricated, so there were no dolphins in Venice's canals. But the point to sort of uh, 
sparked a reflection, which is, uh, could it be, given that we need to bring down these uh, CO2 emissions, given that we need to uh, improve our relationship with uh, uh, nature or restore nature, could it be even once COVID is long gone, even once stay-at-home orders are not uh, a thing anymore, could it be that, uh, let's say, curtailing the economy should be part of the uh, policy toolkit in order to try and achieve our goals? And that's a bit how the um, reflection of the book started, and the whole book is packed in this slide. Um, so if there is only one slide that you take home from this presentation, make it this one. Um, and uh, what, is, what I'm trying to say here is that I started with a reflection on what is the relationship between the between the and nature. As soon as you, you start uh, digging uh, a little bit deeper, you switch from the economy broadly defined to economic growth. Um, and so the book starts as a reflection between on the link between economic growth and nature. And then rapidly, if you're thinking about these things, you have to add an extra layer, which is the way in which societies are organized or if the economic system is organized in our societies, which is capitalism. And so this creates a holy or unholy trinity, depending uh, whether you were in the 60% or in the 40% of the, of the poll before, which, uh, which, uh, which produces this, these uh, interlinkages or this triangle. What the book is about, the book is, about is a reflection on, on all the, uh, the interactions in this triangle. So can growth be compatible with nature? What is the relationship between capitalism and growth? So can we just, uh, let's say, get rid of growth and keep the system uh, that we live in? Um, uh, capitalism become green. So there's a lot of talk of saying, ah, we need to make get, switch to green capitalism. Um, it's uh, very, it's, uh, very yeah. schools where I happen to spend some of my time. Uh, for others, this is impossible. So it is, capitalism is this destructive force that destroys anything in its way, including nature. And so you cannot have one uh, or achieve, let's say, green uh, this green capitalism. When I give these talks. Um, especially to groups of economists, groups of econom especially to groups of macroeconomists, uh, especially to people in the mainstream of economics, they typically stop me already here. Uh, and the reason they do that is that economists always stop you at slide four. They never allow you to go beyond that and they start asking questions. But the second point is they would tell me, ah, but we know that economic growth is important. Why did you even waste two years of your time writing a book about that? And uh, my feeling, and I think that this room, this classroom, and the efforts of E4S are a testament to the fact that actually the usefulness of economic growth is all but clear uh, or all but obvious. And uh, increasingly, there is a questioning of the usefulness of this economic growth. And to my mind, this is due to a variety of factors, one of them being that this time, this time is particularly present in my generation, so millennials and Gen Z. And the reason why that is the case, I argue in the introduction of the book, is that first of all, uh, we're, this is a generation that hasn't seen that much growth. Uh, and that is what the, the chart on the right tries to show. It is for the United States and it shows the cumulative growth that people have seen in the first 15 years of their working life across multiple generations in US history. And it shows that millennials are those that have seen the least. But even going beyond, uh, let's say, the crude, uh, crude numbers, if I look at my own experience, I graduated from, um, from university, from Bocconi, there was the, the great financial, Lehman Brothers, a uh, great financial crisis. So there was a recession there. Then uh, in the Eurozone, there was the Eurozone crisis. And so there was another recession period there. Uh, then we then we had secular stagnation, and so there was a recovery, but it was very slow, basically flat for many countries. Is as the COVID uh, pandemic shock, so again a recession. Now we have a war, so again uh, probably most most likely a recession. So it feels like growth is always behind the corner, but this is a corner that never turns. And on top of that, there is of course a lot of work into inequality. I've taken a picture of Thomas Piketty. He's uh, surely not the only. Uh, one who's been working on this, 
Um, and, uh, and what he shows is, of course, that inequalities have been increasing. So even where we have seen some growth, uh, that has often been pocketed by the top 1%, 0.1%, large corporations, you can slice it and dice it the way you want, but there is a degree of, of concentration, at least in some countries. And so the argument is, so, oh, okay, we haven't seen that much growth. When we have seen it, it, has, it hasn't really benefited the many, the, the, rather the few. And on top of that, we add an increasing environmental awareness of younger generations and the fact that historically, uh, CO2 emissions and economic growth, if you look at the last uh, 200 years or since the Industrial Revolution, uh, have proceeded hand in hand. And therefore, you see why there is an increasing uh, questioning of the usefulness of economic growth. And that's what already the economist was calling in 2019 using US terminology, uh, millennial socialism. And so running some surveys and seeing that uh, increasing numbers of younger generations are questioning the usefulness of growth, of capitalism, and so on. So the first part of the book starts um, with this first uh, with this first nexus and what i try to show off the blocks is that um, given current even current even current preferences i underline this uh, as much as i can because we will go back to it in a second but given current consumer preferences it is likely that some of the features of capitalism so the fact that there is uh, competition between firms that are profit driven and they use uh, novelty, novelty on, uh, on, uh, uh, gain uh, larger and larger swathes of consumers and win in the competition fight. There are certain features, certain features of capitalism that rekindle growth. And uh, what is uh, the, the, the conclusion or the implication of this is it's, all, it's okay. So I don't want to jump to, a, to any conclusion, if not to say that I increasingly or often hear uh, people say, you know, we need to fight uh, against climate change and we need a variety of things. We need to invest in, in renewables. We need more solar power plants. We need more, I don't know, recycling, circular economy. And by the way, we also need to get rid of economic growth. And what I'm trying to say there or caution is, look, uh, because the two are interlocked, what you're telling me when you say we have to uh, ditch economic growth as a principle, uh, you are also telling me that in a way we have to get rid of capitalism, which again is okay up to this point, but then you cannot just ditch it in there or, or put it in there as an extra element on a long list of desiderata. You have to provide at the same time a blueprint for an alternative uh, society. Um, while I was doing my, my research, sitting at home during the lockdown, I tried to have as much of an open mind as possible regarding these topics. We are often, again, accused, and rightly so, as economists, that we only uh, read our uh, own literature. Uh, the joke goes that we write a paper discovering something, and actually sociology had already written a paper about it 100 years ago. Um, and so what I tried to do is uh, to really read anything I could find. So I went uh, beyond uh, narrow economics, uh, drawing on sociology, drawing on anthropology, drawing on social psychology, psychology. anything I could find that could help me answer certain uh, the questions I had in mind, I tried to read from. And on top of that, I also read uh, beyond, uh, so even within economics, I also tried to read beyond the mainstream literature. And while I was doing that, I discovered that there was a wide uh, heterodox literature that had been doing the legwork for several decades of imagining uh, society for, uh, for the post-growth world, let's say. And it was a literature that actually arrived to the exact same conclusion I had arrived to, which is that the two capitalism and economic growth are indeed intertwined, uh, but then they take the step to say, therefore, we need to get rid of growth, and therefore, we also need to get rid of capitalism, because we have to focus on nature, which should be the priority. And while we do that, uh, this will generate uh, some uh, scarcity, some, ec some economic scarcity, but this is fine, because this will be voluntary scarcity, so it's something that we should embrace uh, 
freely and as a positive development along the lines of uh, you know, minimalism on an individual level. So something scaling that up as a principle to society at large. And then saying, you know, we will have less, but we will uh, divide, divide it better. We will be sharing it better, both within countries, uh, but also between countries. And of course, you know that there are great inequalities between uh, rich and poor countries in the world. So there is also this uh, dimension that is brought in there. Now, uh, if you build on this, uh, on this type of reading, uh, and, and I tried to draw out the, the policy conclusions from this uh, wide literature, um, you have uh, what I was mentioning before that you know, they would say uh, we, shall, we have to abandon economic growth, we have to abandon hyper consumerism, at least in advanced in rich economies. Let's say, of course, this uh, needs to let uh, poor countries still uh, grow, develop, because they need to provide for the poorest of the poorest. So it's not a, a, a discourse that is targeted to rich countries. Um, we should continue research and development. So it is not necessarily a movement that says we need the zero innovation, but rather it is innovation that should be centrally planned in the sense that the argument goes that we're letting the private sector do this and the private sector is innovating in a bunch of stuff that nobody needs. Whereas we have a priority of the moment, which is fighting climate change. So we should just focus on that. Let's say government Let's say. set the priorities for innovation. In a, central, uh, in a central manner. Um, in a way, you know, this, uh, this model uh, says uh, there are eco-villages. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this thing. It's, it's an actual thing. They exist. They are places. I'm sure there are some in Switzerland. There are many in Europe. There are several in other parts of the world. These are small communities, 50 to 100 people that as they left their previous life behind, detached from capitalistic principles and sort of live along the lines of uh, basic sufficiency principles, basic trade, the engage culture for food production and, uh, and live happily that way. So the idea, let's say, of a, of a degrowth policy agenda is to scale up this model to society at large. And, um, and finally, of course, you produce locally, as I was mentioning, and ideally it's also partnered with direct democracy or, or a collegial consensus uh, decision making. Now, uh, G4G, which stands for Growth for Good, uh, and this is the book or the official hashtag of the book, says, comes to, uh, to some different and the reason why I come to different conclusions after having uh, gone into the details uh, of the criticisms that the growth uh, uh, receives uh, at face value, value. I, I come to the conclusion that it is very unlikely that this vision would play out in the way in which it is uh, imagined. And the reason for that is that in a way, when you are in a steady state environment, so when resources are limited and you take that as granted, that resources are limited in, in, in society, this does not pave the way for greater sharing between uh, countries or even within societies. And rather, um, it, uh, it paves the way for more conflict within societies. And again, I try to provide a variety of, of examples, episodes, uh, you know, like back to fun, uh, which is a classic is we know of periods in history where growth was limited. And as a matter of fact, most of our history was a period in which growth was limited. Uh, growth existed in the past, so it's not an invention of the Industrial Revolution, but it was low. And in many cases, uh, uh, countries experienced for a long time uh, sort of sluggish, uh, sluggish growth. And it is not like in feudal societies, you had this ultra developed welfare state where, where resources would flow from the rich to the poor. And to the extent that there were redistribution, it was redistribution from the poorest or the less powerful to the most powerful and the richest rather than the other way around. <clears throat> and the reason for this is that there is this understanding that, or there is this persuasion that I disagree with that the desire for more is a product of capitalism that imposes on us this constant need for stuff that we don't really need. So these artificial needs that are a product of capitalism. 
Um, and, you know, examples are given of advertisement that uh, pushes us to consume stuff or uh, planned obsolescence, again, a bad thing that pushes us to consume more. But if you zoom out and, and put these things into perspective, it is rather unlikely that this is the capitalism imposing uh, this desire for more as a broad concept on otherwise uh, in the, um, indifferent individuals. Um, and I would argue that the desire for more, in a way, is what has powered. Uh, you can read, let's say, the, the history of humanity, so really zooming out as much as you can, as a constant desire for more. So you, you use what you, our only advantage on this planet, which is the capacity for uh, developing collective knowledge at scale and passing this on, and you use that in order to shape the environment to get more of what you want more of. You can look at the, the, the use of fire in order to cook meat or, or food and preserve it for longer. You can look at the, the development of clothing in the beginning as an item used then to be able to migrate to higher, to higher latitude. There's constantly a desire for more rather than take the environment as it is and then using technology and know-how in order to reach those, uh, those goals. So it sort of links to this uh, idea of self-denial of, self of species, taking your destiny in your own hands. I wanted to give you an example. I take this from, the, um, from an article uh, by Martin Wolf, who's a financial commentator in the Financial Times, who ran a little thought experiment a few years back. And what he was saying is, okay, let's assume for a second, and I explain to you the graph in a, in a, in a minute. In a minute. Says, let's assume for a second that GDP is capped. And so from now on until the end of the end of our century, GDP at world level is capped. If we, if we were to do that, and uh, let's say the pace at which we are greening our economy continues at the same, so we continue at the same pace to decarbonize our economy, by 2050, emissions would be down by 40% which obviously is very far from the net zero that climate scientists tell us we should uh, reach in order to avoid the worst of the worst of, of climate uh, catastrophe. The alternative is that you try to bring down those emissions by rather than keeping GDP capped by shrinking GDP. And, uh, and when you do that, of course, we are talking about a small subset of countries because we this is an option that, is, that goes for rich economies, it's not for everybody in the world. Um, when you do that, and so you focus on few countries, what you're saying effectively, and I take these projections from Peter Victor, which is a, a degrowth economist, so I don't want to pretend that I'm doing project fear, as they were calling it in, uh, in the Brexit case. Um, you take the projections of Peter Victor and his model, and he says uh, income should shrink more or less 60%. In rich countries, it takes Canada, I believe, as an example. So what we're talking about here is not for you to change your iPhone uh, once every four years instead of once every two years. We're talking a sharp reduction in, uh, in income levels. Um, and what this makes you wonder is whether this is uh, uh, likely to, to happen, uh, particularly so in a democracy, but even in, uh, in a non-democratic uh, setting. The alternative of this type of chart is that you want to accelerate sharply the rate of decarbonization, which effectively means you need to, to accelerate the, the rate of development and deployment of green technologies. Um, just one point, I'm sure that we will go back to this, uh, but just one point. What I try to say while I, while I do this reflection is absolutely so that we have pursued up until now is a model that is based on fossil fuels. It is a growth model that is based on fossil fuels. And of course, it is not a growth model that is feasible for the future. So let's, the, let's get this out of the way. I'm not saying everything can continue and everything is fine. Everything is not fine. Nothing is fine, actually. And so we cannot continue the growth model using the growth model we have used the Industrial Revolution, but rather need a different type of growth model. Um, and what I try to say in the book is, uh, as, I, as I was mentioning, as I was hinting before, economic growth has not started when we started exploiting fossil fuels. 
It was slow growth, it was uneven, it was marked by sharp rises and falls, but it has, but it has a phenomenon that has started in the moment in which we have started digging out fossil fuels from the ground, from the ground. And so I believe that there is an alternative growth model that was possible, but we need to do something to reach it, which is what I'm trying to say here, uh, adding an extra layer and saying, with all its problems, and again, I'm not pretending capitalism is great, it's fantastic. No, it actually has a lot of, of problems. It has some of these tendencies to uh, concentrate uh, power and money into the pockets of few, and so left up to its own devices, it doesn't work. It is actually likely to be self-destructive. Uh, but if there is one thing that it has proven efficient at, it is the development and the deployment of new technologies and innovation. And so what I wonder is, couldn't it be that we can use this tool to reorient it towards the societal priorities of the moment, which is achieving a green transition? So rather than dreaming of smashing the whole system with all the soul searching that then this entails to create or find a new societal model and do the revolution, can we rather put uh, some uh, uh, correctives in place in order to orient this uh, mechanism to our own needs of the moment. I do not, again, I do not want to, let me stress this again, but it is to say, I'm not saying that capitalism is going to do this on its own. So I don't want you to walk out of this room saying, ah, let you told us that everything is fine, capitalism will take care, and therefore I don't have to work on climate change. No, absolutely, absolutely you have. Um, we all have. And actually the agenda I talk about is an agenda that uh, requires a lot of government. So there is government policy, we can talk about it. There's the classics, uh, album taxes, regulation, and so on. Um, but it doesn't stop there. So I cannot, we cannot, sitting in Brussels, uh, run the climate transition on our own. We need other agents in society to be active in this. It means uh, uh, that companies, pioneering companies can be, have a role in this. And crucially that citizens and consumers have a role in this as well. Uh, not least because what citizens allow to happen or the degree to which they are engaged on the green agenda sets the, the peri perimeter of what is feasible for policy makers of uh, putting the policies in place. And so this is probably closer to a whole of nation approach. I wanted to mention uh, one thing, uh, which is that to my mind, what we're trying to do in terms of the transformation, the scale of the transformation we're trying to do is close, closer to an industrial revolution than to a few fixes here and there in the sense that we have to reinvent the whole of production, the whole of consumption, housing, transport, uh, you name it. And therefore, um, what I try to do is to learn again from the other literatures, literatures, literatures economic and history, literature, what happened with past industrial revolutions in order to use that, uh, that, that know-how to inform our uh, actions now. One of the conclusions building on this great book by late professor Calestus Juma, um, what he does is uh, effectively he looks at in innovations of the past, important big innovations of the past, and he tries to understand why is it that, for example, the printing press uh, spread rapidly in Europe and instead it took 200 more years for it to spread in the uh, Islamic world, let's say. And he does this for a variety of innovations. And what he concludes is where there are large groups of society that stand to lose or fear, fear that they stand to lose. So perception and reality is sort of beyond the point here. But if there are groups, large groups that fear they will lose out of innovation, they will oppose it. No matter whether this comes to the detriment of society as a whole, uh, you will uh, just uh, be unable to roll out these uh, technologies. And therefore, this leads to the importance of a so-called just transition, if you want to use the slogans, or the idea of building people, bringing, bringing people on board. So making sure that uh, regions that are left behind, professions that are left behind, um, cultural values that are left behind are shattered, 
uh, all of these people uh, see a place in the future green economy because if not, they will oppose it. And I speak about some social limits of innovation aside from the technical ones that I'm sure some of you are very well aware of, of uh, rolling out solar panels at the speed we need them or uh, of uh, shore wind or whatnot. There's much more in the book that I could not uh, cover, but just to give you a sense of, uh, of what's in there, there is a reflection a bit on the interplay between economic growth uh, and well-being. You know, uh, you were mentioning I work on beyond GDP, and so I, I try to reflect on uh, what is the interplay between economic growth, GDP, well-being, the things that matter, and so on, and a link to liberal democracy. I presented to you something that sounds super abstract. This dude that is looking at the history of the Middle Ages to inform about what is happening now with the green transition, not at all. There is a part of the book that is more theoretical, but the, the book is also quite practical. And you can see this in the fact that some chapters are extremely hands-on. There's a case study, for example, in Italy, taken as an example of a country that has fallen by accident, so not by policy design, but by accident in a sort of steady state, given it hasn't seen uh, GDP growth uh, uh, in real terms over the past years, basically. And I discussed the uh, toxic forces that are unleashed uh, when that uh, happens, particularly if you're in an international environment, so where other countries continue instead uh, growing. And this brings in an international dimension, which is to say, OK, but what is credible? We know that climate change is a global problem. We often say it's a global problem, it requires global solutions. OK, but what is likely to be the type of cooperation that we, we can credibly expect uh, going forward on, uh, on climate change? Um, and there's a final chapter, which is uh, uh, perhaps more of interest to, to macroeconomists or economists, because it sort of turns the question of this session around. So oftentimes, even uh, when uh, I don't have uh, 40% uh, of the audience against economic growth, and I'm just talking to macroeconomists, they tell me, okay, we're doing this green transition, but this is not gonna produce growth. It's just, uh, you know, we're switching the polluting option for the non-polluting option, but at the end of the day, we're sort of doing the same thing, uh, just with different means. So this is not a growth opportunity. And that I try to rebuke that argument, argument part of the book. Um, we can look at that if you want, or I can also stop here and we can just go into the question and answer as you prefer. Are we doing, are we doing on time? So I think uh, we are going. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. We're gonna have... So everybody still awake? Did we, did we lose someone down there? Everybody is awake, yeah. Great. Well, the, the presentation was really, really interesting. Thank you very much. And as you said, uh, you added the time. I'm developing the book. Uh, there is so much more that uh, I had the opportunity to read. But I think with the beginning of the discussion, we, we will uh, have the opportunity to explore a little bit more uh, some of those points. And then we'll open uh, a session of questions from your side. So I really encourage everybody to uh, raise the hand and, and ask a question if you had. If you have, so don't don't need it. But let's uh, let's begin. Uh, I want to to ask as a first question. I, I want to link with uh, the, the presentation, like the, the little uh, box pop that we have uh, seen at the beginning of the students. And uh, one student said um, that uh, some industries will grow, some others have to shut down. So we are now facing uh, two options. The first is degrowth. Okay, there is this. Uh, this volunteer of uh, degrowth. The other one is to grow again, but of course, some industries will need to change, will need to dis disappear because we can't continue like that, as you said. Now we have two main problems. So first, the industries that are right now at the top of the economy are often not the ones that should continue in the way. And the second one is that there is a fear in our society of losing jobs in the short term, of course, and, and so there is this resistance to a complete change in, the, in our behavior and in our economy. And how can we, can we answer to that situation? What do you think? Um, so my, my first reaction to this is to say absolutely yes. So when I say this transition or when I disagree 
in saying this transition uh, will generate growth, it doesn't mean that the, you, you will just have the current economy and everything continues growing in the current economies or in the, all sectors uh, of the current economy. There are some sectors that we know will have to disappear, full stop. So there are certain industries that will need to disappear um, and the composition of the economy will change. So some uh, firms, especially firms that miss out uh, on the green transition, green revolution, green technologies, will be wiped out from the uh, market, realistically. Realistic. Um, and others will emerge. Uh, new ones will emerge um, and will produce jobs uh, in the process. What I try to say, uh, I often uh, try to give to um, people sitting in firms as well. Um, and what I try to tell them is, of course, it is hard. And we hear constantly, um, I think I was told uh, um, last week or a few weeks ago, uh, the CEO of Stellantis, uh, so the car producer, was telling Macron in France, oh, you see, you're going too fast and we're going to lose a lot of jobs. What I try to uh, tell these CEOs is the reason why the green transition is happening is not because of government action, but it is because people want it to happen. And government action is there to speed up the process and break lock-ins. But it is not like Macron is doing the green transition and imposing it on people. And rather the success of the green transition will rest on the degree to which people buy uh, into it. And that's a bit the interplay I was telling you about what citizens can do and what governments can do. And they sort of, uh, they're at a nexus there. And when you see, when you see, you want to try, even as a firm, you want to try and be at the forefront of this green revolution. If you believe, as I believe, that there is no alternative. So there is no business as usual scenario ahead of us. There is one where the world is going to shambles and there is one in which we make a success of the green transition. If you look at it this way, you know that there will be a, a green transition or that it is the, the best uh, case scenario and that the business as usual scenario doesn't exist. And when you look at it that way, you want to try and be the one that does the, the, these technologies or masters these technologies and does it fast and does it first. If you think about it, given we're speaking about cars, um, you know, names like Benz, names like Maybach, uh, names like Porsche, all of these were, I don't have to tell you, all of years. And they were engineers that at the turn of the, of the last century, the big yeah, the last century, the last century in crucial aspects of the internal combustion engine. The fact that uh, uh, Germany or firms in Germany managed to move there first gave them a, a head start that they've kept for almost a hundred years. And what I'm trying to say now is that is not no longer a viable option. Try and be the, the, the one having these, the new Benzes and Maybachs and, uh, and so on of the green transition. And therefore it is in your direct interest also as a firm uh, to, to innovate, innovate fast and be uh, part of this green transition. Um, in terms of jobs, because you were asking uh, what happens to jobs, which is obviously a, a great concern, um, I think it's a bit the, the, the same point, which is to say, when, I, when, I, when you look at these projections uh, that uh, you know, international, well, international firms try to do, the International Labour Organization, for example, or the UN, or the UN model, what will happen to jobs once you do the green transition, and it looks sort of neutral. Like, ah, if we were to completely transition to the green economy, well, we'll create, I don't know, a couple of million more jobs, which on a planetary scale is not that much. So it's more or less neutral. The idea is that you will just switch from one profession to the other and so on. To me, that is extremely blinded uh, an approach, which is to say, who cares that on aggregate at the world level, uh, you will uh, broadly have the same amount of jobs. Nothing assures you that they will be created in the same places. And so that's why you need, uh, again, uh, government action to a certain extent to make sure that this is uh, a transition that, is, uh, uh, that also produces jobs. And that's why, to my mind, you're seeing governments in, in investing more in uh, uh, research, in, in so-called in green industrial policy, in infrastructure, and so on, because 
the, you want to try also as a government to be at the forefront of this uh, green transition and produce jobs or keep jobs at home as well. Thank you very much, Alessio. Um, so to pass to the second question, I, I have a few and some other ones came up uh, during the <laughs> presentation, so I could continue uh, for long, but I'm going to uh, soon leave the, the place to the public. Um, as you said, we have two paths to choose. The one is the degrowth, so the complete disruption of our society as we, we are imagining it today, as we are going uh, today. And the other one is to have this transition. Um, but like growth has been linked to capitalism uh, in a very negative uh, way in the last 58 years. years. So uh, you defend in your presentation, in your book, that growth uh, can really be seen as a, something that benefits not just the few, but the population, the global population, everybody, uh, because it's an investment that is needed to develop and improve a global transition, a global uh, sustainable transition. So how can we, uh, what can we do? Uh, how can we think uh, should be done to disrupt this actual perception of capitalism and growth and rethink it in the good way that can really allow us to act uh, fast to get the transition going on? So to my mind, you know, when, I, when I try to think about these, uh, these issues, um, capitalism is often given much more agency than it deserves. So it is a way of organizing incentives in uh, society uh, and my impression is that it has become this boogeyman on which we can blame a lot of the ills of, uh, of our current society. But I would claim that it is more an enabler, or even economic growth is more an enabler. You have more resources, you can use these resources to do good stuff or bad stuff. Uh, but I wouldn't blame uh, the system per se. And putting things into perspective, I've heard a lot. I was in Lucca at a sustainability festival a few weeks ago, and some old uh, uh, trade union uh, guy from Tuscany, so you can imagine very uh, of a communist uh, tradition uh, in the, with a capital C, let's see, let's, of Italian uh, politics uh, stands up and he's like, yeah, of course, capitalism is a system that is against people and against nature. And I have to say that I've been reflecting on this because it really struck me as a, also as a, as a slogan. And I've been reflecting on it for, for a few weeks now. And again, when you look at the, at the evidence it, or, or the data, it, it is very odd, especially if you look at it in the long term, it is a very odd way of phrasing it. If you look at people, for example, so focusing on the first dimension, um, I, you know, across a battery of variety of indicators, it's, it's hard for me to say which are the indicators that you think matter in life, whether it is education, whether it is length of life, whether it is quality of life years, whether it is amount of free time, whether it is safety, whether you, you can look at a variety of these things over the past 200 years, uh, these have improved in capitalistic societies and they have improved widely. To an extent that I was reading, I don't remember where I was, uh, in which book I was reading this, uh, or which article of the past few days, uh, the, the middle class today of a rich country enjoys a standard of life that would have been the envy of the richest of the richest 400 years ago. So this to put things into the long-term perspective, which again does not mean everything is fine and therefore uh, you know, social critiques are ill-placed and nothing can improve, not at all. I don't want to pretend to, that I'm here to be the Dr. Pangloss of uh, capitalism, that this is the best world, and so that there's nothing that can be done. Um, but it's just to, to put this, these things into perspective on one dimension. On the environmental dimension, again, it is a fact that, of course, uh, CO2 emissions have uh, exploded over the past 200 years. The, environment, the toll on the environment has been dire, but to my mind, again, this is not so much a, 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 res, a direct result of the system, but rather a direct result of the fact that for a very long time, we considered nature as unlimited. And uh, again, to put these things into perspective, if you put it in you know, the long-term history of humanity, it shouldn't surprise. For the longest time of our history, as a species, extremely small, and we were at the mercy 
of nature, of natural events, of, uh, of storms, of droughts, of events that we didn't understand, of, uh, of uh, uh, disease, of events that we did were beyond our understanding. And so nature was, uh, was seen as, uh, as something uh, large and uh, impossible to comprehend and surely not to control. This has changed with the Industrial Revolution. And uh, you know, it's a fact that it has probably taken us too much time to realize that uh, greater powers that come with greater technologies, technologies responsibilities, as Spider-Man uh, says, as Churchill was saying before Spider-Man, as the French uh, Constitutional Convention was saying before Churchill, and so on. So it is a fact that it's probably taking us too long as a group, as a society, but that is the origin of the problem, I believe. And you can see it in the fact that societies that have given up a capitalistic model, and I'm thinking, for example, of a Soviet Union type of, of model that didn't have capitalism, it didn't have price incentives, it didn't have profits, it didn't have GDP, it wasn't measuring GDP, it was measuring other stuff. So they didn't have all of these things that we blame for uh, the reason why we are, we've been destroying the environment. None of these were there, and the environmental toll has been uh, horrendous, if not worse, than what we've seen in other um, capitalistic societies or Western societies or whatever you want to call them. And so, to my mind, the shift that is needed, and that's why I put people at the center together with governments and, and companies, is a shift in mindset, which links, and it's something that we were discussing also with Jean-Pierre at the beginning of the conference, this is not to say, and this is fundamental, I know it's not the question you asked me, but it's something fundamental that I want to make clear. I am not saying technology will wash away all the problems, and therefore you can keep on going with your life as it is, because you don't need to make any changes. Actually, the other way around, the more you're willing to make changes, the better. I'm all for it. You want to stop eating meat because it's uh, carbon intensive? Do it. Go ahead. You want to persuade your family and friends to do the same? Go ahead. I'm all for it. I'm not saying you shouldn't do that. All I'm saying is I wouldn't put the center of our climate action around behavioral changes. Because if you do that, you're resting this wholly on people and you're hoping that this will be embraced as something joyful and great to just be uh, appreciated. Maybe adding a moral uh, argument that it's in the interest of future generation and so on. And this does not work. And so I'm just saying uh, we need also the technological dimension to help us smooth the process. But go ahead, uh, if you don't want to buy a car, if you don't want to fly, if you don't want to do all the things that we know, if you want to turn down your thermostat, it helps with the war, it helps uh, with climate change. So go for it. I'm all in favor of it. Thank you, Lesu, for this second uh, answer. Very detailed. And uh, you gave me a, a lot of, uh, of points uh, to, to tackle my third question that uh, is going to sum up a little bit, I think, all these, uh, these concepts. Um, actually, in your book uh, and in your way of presenting here today, you are quite optimistic of the future. We can say, like, you believe that this transition can actually take place and that we can go in a, on a good path. Uh, and you say also in your book that we have the knowledge, that we have more knowledge today than we ever uh, had in the, in the past. So we really can uh, do something with what we have, technology, innovation, and uh, instruction, of course, uh, well, the opportunity of having a university like EPFL, UNIL, UEMD, that uh, can, uh, can let us grow. But uh, you said in your uh, answer to the present question that we need also action from the politics, action, concrete actions from them. But today we still see that the scientific point of view that we have is not at all fair, is not at all taken into consideration. And we have a demonstration of the fact that a professor of UNIL just a few days ago was arrested for a nonviolent uh, communication on uh, the fact that they needed to be heard. So what can we do if changing just the behavior of our uh, everyday life is, the, in your opinion, not enough and politics doesn't hear our voice? What, what can we do? What do you think we should do? Um, so there's something that... Okay. Um,
but what I'm trying <laughs> I I can't go very <laughs> <long enough. laughs> has to stop at some point. <laughs> Um, what I, to my mind, these, uh, I saw actually, I saw your professor being arrested and dragged uh, away on Twitter. Um, so I think the question, the way I phrased it, the importance of citizens and so on, and the role of government and, and et cetera, I, I think that the question is whether these actions help to foster the attention and to bring a more wider public um, on board with the green transition. Uh, this is an open question. There are those that say, you know, all this uh, throwing a paint at uh, Monet or Van Gogh is a, is a secret op by big oil because it, uh, it makes the case of the green transition uh, uh, even harder on those that are not already on board. Um, and uh, and there are others that say no, actually this is good because it can uh, effect, and you you end up on the front cover of the New York Times, and so at least people are reminded that the green transition is, or the climate change is happening, that is important, and so on. And I think that is a bit the key. Um, so that on the positive side, on the negative side, uh, maybe just one word on uh, on yeah. Um, and and in a way, the, the reading of society on which some of this rests is so say society would be on board or people would be on board. And the reason why many of these things don't happen is just because a uh, few rich individuals, companies, board members are concocting plans uh, in the back rooms and buying out politicians. I think this is a bit of a uh, simplistic reading in the sense that the green transition is hard and the politics of it are hard and uh, blaming it only on companies uh, or on the lobbying efforts on companies is probably a step too much in the sense that yes we could ban oil tomorrow yes you can do a lot to do that but we are we've see we're seeing right now what happens in the moment in which uh, you run out of one of the energy sources that you were using up to uh, up up to a few months ago. And it is the, the shock that this has on the overall system, on prices, on living standards, and so on and so forth. And so I think that the difficulty is to devise this at a speed and in a way that is balancing the politics and obviously the need to reach climate targets as scientists are pointing out. In this, uh, perhaps only one word, which comes, uh, I was mentioning to you, uh, before this conference, that I come from a from a family of uh, natural scientists, um, and to my mind or my impression is that uh, natural scientists have provided a lot of of evidence, of useful evidence, the IPCC report and so on, that chart the path ahead, ahead and uh, warn us of the risks and the probabilities and so on. But I would not. Um, how can I put it? This does not automatically translate into action, which is why social sciences also have a role. The fact that you tell me we need to follow this decarbonization speed doesn't make it happen on its own. There are entrenched difficulties, political difficulties, uh, cultural difficulties, whatever it is, uh, um, engineering challenges and so on that are there. And it is the interaction of all these disciplines working in tandem that will produce the ultimate green uh, green transition and the fact that we, we have an optimal one that is laid out before our eyes uh, doesn't make it happen and my impression is that economists often fall in this trap because economics typically you know uh, identifies the optimal equilibrium and that says uh, you know that's it i've done my my job it is for politicians to do the optimal thing and if they don't is because politicians are stupid which to my mind is a bit uh, reductive. Uh, the challenges are real. I'm sure there are also politicians that are stupid, but it is not uh, chiefly or mostly uh, the problem or the root of the problem. 
Thank you. Thank you, Alessio. So before uh, I get all the ground here, I continue posing, asking my question that uh, I really would like to have an answer to. Uh, I open the, the session to uh, to question from uh, from the public. So if you you have any question, you just raise your hand as Sasha has done it. Very good. And Julia will come to you. That is the nice thing of being in the, in the front. Uh, Alessio, thank you very much. I actually just have your your book right here on my computer, so I will read it. I haven't done that yet. <laughs> so, um, uh, but 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 of course, uh, the, the 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 main the main message that we get is that we uh, should use capitalism as an ally and continue growing and do all the do it in a good way. Now, let me try to ask a little bit about the the, the boundary conditions. To, today, the economy. Uh, not so much in terms of money, but physically, it has a metabolism of 600 exajoules and 100 gigatons of material. How much should it grow? What should be the, what should be the maximum size? Obviously, it can't be infinite. So, so what is that physical size in energy and material it should reach? And uh, uh, in, in terms of capitalism, what parts of capitalism do we want to keep? There's a lot of stuff in capitalism. Is it private property? Is it accumulation of capital? <clears throat> I'm sorry. Is it markets, competition, all of them, or just a subset of that? Can we define these things? Then, then I think we can have a more detailed discussion. Um, yes. So the, the first relates to this idea that you know growth is has been partnered with CO2 emissions or a breach of planetary boundaries across a variety of, uh, of, of indicators or a greater use of energy. And therefore that this is uh, in a way because we need to bring those down or back into planetary boundaries, this will uh, uh, destroy value or put a cap on, on, on economic growth. To my mind, um, this is a very... Uh, mechanic way of, of looking at the problem um, and rather uh, perhaps because we are in the social sciences uh, social sciences tend to be much more flexible in the sense that economic growth is about value creation and it is about goods servicing a need typically uh, you you want uh, lights in your house in order to be able to see you care about being able to see at night how this happens is sort of beyond the point. Whether you use a, a candle, whether you use a whale fat, whether you use a, a light bulb, old style, or LED is beyond the point. These things, however, have completely different impacts on the environment, completely different, as you know, energy uses, um, and completely different prices. And, uh, and the reason why I'm optimistic about some of these things is to say we can continue, uh, mm -hmm. and we have seen it happen uh, in the past, to service needs while using different materials, if it is things that we shouldn't be using anymore, I'm thinking I'm and the nitrogen cycle that is uh, messed up, or CO2 emissions and, and greenhouse gases, or uh, so not using things that we're not supposed to be using anymore or using different things uh, or doing things in a different way. And that will uh, generate uh, value, but value is not necessarily stuff. So it is not necessarily that I want more stuff to be produced. And I'm not saying, you know, when I defend economic growth, I'm not saying, no, we should all have five phones instead of one. That's not my point. But rather economic growth is a different phenomenon given by the fact that your phone now has probably 20 properties, including a camera, including a calculator, including a, a note taking, including computing power that before would have uh, uh, encompassed a lot more stuff in your life. And it is instead compressed in less material use, less energy use and so on. And so that is a bit the type of, uh, of growth I have uh, in, uh, in mind. In terms of, of capitalism and, and what, uh, um, and by the way, this is also true for energy use. So what is interesting is that you can look at uh, generally societies that are reaching higher levels of complexity do so while using uh, uh, more energy. 
But then if you focus on advanced economies over the past 20 to 30 years, uh, energy, primary energy use has been sort of flat. Uh, and economic growth is, uh, has increased by 60% or so. And so all this is to mean that it's not necessarily a translation one-to-one, -one, want growth, therefore we want more energy use. Uh, this doesn't necessarily have to be the case. In terms of capitalism um, and what we want to retain and what we don't, um, ideally what I would want to retain, and you, you might have seen that, uh, and you would, will see it uh, once you make it to chapter eight, I believe, which is all on the role of technology and innovation and the role this has played throughout human history and for the importance this will play right now. Um, what I would like to retain is the system's capacity in fostering this uh, while taking away some of the bad stuff. And what I'm trying to say there is, look, capitalism is an extremely adaptable system. And maybe that is at the origin of its success. So the fact that it has adapted to different circumstances in different moments in time across different geographies is probably at the heart of the reason why so many of the predictions of doom, going back to Karl Marx, but there has been many uh, that were predicting uh, the system to collapse on itself and implode, have not uh, uh, come to, uh, to, to the fore. And, um, but it can change, it has shown that it can change and, and we have seen that. And so to give you a practical example, the capitalism of Franklin Delano Roosevelt after the 1950s is not the capitalistic system of the 1980s. Uh, 80s. Falling under, if you want to call it the neoliberal model or minimal government, minimal government spending, uh, ultra free markets, limited regulation. These are both, it's still the US, it's different moments in time, there's still capitalism, but with different uh, traits. And what I have in mind is probably a capitalism that has a larger government role than we have seen over the past 20 to 30 years, uh, in part to invest in the green transition, in part to break the technological lock-ins that we are stuck in, uh, in part to do the just transition aspect that I was talking about. So to make sure that jobs are created, the reskilling is done when it's needed, the regions are not left behind, and some of them are heavily invested in the fossil fuel uh, world. Um, so it is doing all of, these, uh, all of these things. Maybe one point that uh, doesn't get enough attention, and given you were mentioning I'm optimistic and why am I so optimistic, this is something that I get all the times. And I have to say, it's even written on uh, one of the blurbs on the back of the book is like Alessio Terzi is a compelling optimistic take. I mean, I didn't write the book to be optimistic. I didn't, while I was writing it, I didn't think, oh, I'm so optimistic. I'm going to write an optimistic take on, uh, on climate change. Uh, this was an exploration on a variety of topics. As a matter of fact, when I talk to fellow authors, they often tell me that books are written in a bit of an odd way. So you decide what you want to argue and then you build the book around it. This is not the way my book was written. It is an inquiry into some of these topics. You will see it because the chapters sort of evolve as a thought process. Some people like that, some people don't like that, but just to give you a sense of why that is the case. I didn't write the book to be optimistic and I, I don't even see it necessarily that way. What gives me optimism is that, or the reason why I think that people say I'm optimistic is that I have seen different civilizations at different moments in time face environmental challenges, climatic challenges, and some of them have managed to face them and uh, thrive or survive. Others have not. And so I'm not here to say that, that you know, for sure thing, uh, we're going to navigate this process and it's all going to be fine, uh, all good and fine. Um, I'm just saying that it is possible, I believe, and that while the challenge is on a larger scale, we also have greater knowledge, uh, know-how, and capacity for innovation. And so the, the challenge is larger, but our strengths are larger. And so that's how, that's the ground on which this will happen, um, of the battle will happen. Yes, another question from there.
thank you. Um, thank you for your presentation. Uh, my question was like to, to redirect capitalism for good and green growth and, and transition. But are, what, what are the, and you also said like uh, government action is needed, but what are the concrete measures you would uh, pri prioritize or suggest? Um, and also a little question was, what is your definition actually of, of growth? Is it based on GDP and? Very good. Um, so in terms of what government action, what governments can do and the practicality of it all, uh, going beyond the grand statements of uh, we need more, grow, more, more government role, uh, what I tried to say in uh, in the uh, in chapter eight and nine, I don't know, um, is that uh, effectively I lay out I lay out an agenda that tries to do two things. The first is to say if you want to leverage capitalism, capitalism is a system. System organizes. Uh, that is one of the features of the of the system. Incidentally, is one of the reasons why we have. Uh, the problem of, uh, of CO2 emissions or a lot of these environmental pressures uh, given by the fact that uh, these things are not priced. And so because they're not priced, uh, they, are, they are not organized in any way. Uh, and so in a system organized around prices, you, you don't have prices for this stuff, there is no organization. And therefore that's when you see the destruction of environmental spaces, the emission of, uh, of, of CO2 and so on. So you need to, uh, use price, prices in order to bring uh, the rest of society on board or re reorient the system in the direction. And there is all the discussion, classic discussion on relative on um, carbon pricing and, and so on. So I'm not going to go into that because it's a bad standard. Economists have been saying this thing for a very long time, but it doesn't stop at that. And it doesn't stop at that because there are many distortions in in the in, in the market right now. And that is not the only one. I was mentioning before that there is, to a certain degree, there are some technological lock-ins. And that, what that means is that, for example, uh, when, you, when, you, when you've decided to adopt a certain technology, you build the infrastructure for that specific technology. And in practical terms, it means that you have a, a gasoline distributor every two kilometers, um, but you don't have an electric uh, charger uh, every, every one kilometer. Uh, and this creates a lock-in because it means that even if the technologies were identical, so say that an electric vehicle and the internal combustion engine alternative were identical in terms of price, you would still have a distortion away from, from one technology uh, and towards the other. And so you can use government action and in particular public investment to try and break some of these uh, uh, technological lock-ins. I have something in favor of regulation saying sometimes uh, carbon pricing is just not an option. It cannot be an, made an option because it's politically toxic. A classic example is the US. The US is incapable of agreeing at the federal level on a carbon tax. Part of the reason being that it has the name tax in it, and so it's seen as bad. You need to produce at least 20% of electricity with renewables uh, by year 20, whatever, 2025. You can use that. It is suboptimal of reasons I'm not gonna, but you can use that and you're, you're, you're of shifting relative prices. You can use again to shift relative prices by saying, uh, uh, you know, creativity is, uh, is the sky's the limit in terms of creativity that you can do with regulation. Uh, but you, you're seeing some of it again with, with uh, electric vehicles. So if I say you can park for free, you can go downtown for, or you can enter the city center if you have an EV, uh, you can. When you're doing all these things, you get, you get a bonus malus reduction. I've discovered that this is a thing in France. Um, so you, you do all these things and you are sort of making one alternative better than the other and you're twisting relative prices. Um, there's a lot of more stuff you can do. You can invest in research. So this is a classic example. It, go, it falls under the name of uh, 
Indust green industrial policy, uh, famous, uh, one of the famous uh, uh, defendant of this line of argument is Mariana Mazzucato, who's an economist at uh, UCL. And she's been saying for a long time, governments should invest, should have a stronger role in uh, research, uh, in research and development. Her classic line is to say, you know, her iPhone smart was developed, so this agency of the US government. So governments can do some research and development, and they should do more and invest more in some of these technologies, uh, especially early stage, because early stage is where companies are extremely risk averse, and you don't want to be the one that is doing, uh, is, is, is putting big money into a technology that uh, is not even clear whether it's going to uh, come to the uh, fore or not. And so you have a government role in that uh, aspect, but you know there's a lot uh, there's a lot more that uh, that you can do. Ah, there was another question on uh, growth on GDP and growth. So to me, great question. This is what some of my um, lessons uh, when I when I lecture. This is one of the topics I I always discuss, which is, is the economic growth and GDP. Economic growth is the concept. GDP is a statistical artifact developed to try and track the concept. Um, the concept is, uh, to my mind, so in my interpretation, I was mentioning value creation, so you're, you're just creating more value and you're servicing more needs. Uh, but to my mind, the way we have we've been doing that as, uh, as humans, uh, and again, uh, long-term perspective, to use technologies in order to service some needs, um, relative needs of the moment. And so to me, that is uh, what economic growth is all about. And that is why, to me, technology and innovation, innovation and, uh, and growth are actually two ways of saying the same thing. And so for those of you that are doing uh, innovation, science, research, development of new tools, uh, uh, or trying to improve uh, tools we already have, to me, you're agents of growth. You might be in the 40% that dislikes economic growth and wants it abolished, but if you look at it this way, you are actually agents, agents of, of growth, and I think that's a good thing. Uh, GDP is just a statistical artifact to try and measure some of this. It does sometimes a good job, sometimes a bad job. It has some limitations. Uh, it has some limitations for the green economy as well. It has some limitations in the fact that nature is not accounted in it. Um, so it has absolutely limitations, but they're not the same thing. Thank you very much. Some other questions from the audience? Uh, we, are, we have already passed the time. Okay. 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 So I think we'll have uh, some time to ask some more questions if you want. Uh, to Alessio, uh, outside, right? There is a, a yes. little... Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks to Thanks. both of you, first of all, for the presentation. Yes, uh, that's exactly what I guess some of you were waiting for. You'll have the opportunity to ask some questions uh, in a minute to Alessio. I would like to give a round of applause to our uh, two Italian <laughs> speakers. It was a pleasure to organize this together. So the oh, Ivoire yes. Center yeah, together with you. Uh, we are uh, excited to continue this outside. And uh, if you enjoyed, don't miss next event that is going to be around uh, December. Exactly, Date we're planning to decide, but uh, exactly. we'll organize again. <laughs> don't miss out the next one. Go for a drink, and um, also happy to share that we, the Ivoire Center, is in its, its third year, so celebrating its third year. We will have other topics like this one to discuss on the 18th of November in our annual summit. So we will share that information. And if you are interested, you can apply. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye.